down a stream and you were to drop a bit of dye in that water or some salt or a tennis ball, whatever, and you would watch that object or solute travel, that's advection. That's it. All it means is that whatever's in the water is traveling with the water. So you can imagine that in a very simple situation, you might start off with a system that's flowing, in this case from left to right, and you might at some point, t equals zero, could be any time you want, you could start adding a concentration to the water at a given location. I fully realize that this is dry and boring, so let's look at a cool picture. Look at that! Isn't the USGS cool? Look at what they get to do. This is um, a drone image of a dye that they added by boat to a huge river. I mean, can you imagine that this is what somebody gets to go do for a job? It's, it's actually a screen cap from a video, and I really recommend that you Google it. Not right now, but soon, and watch the whole thing. It's too long to show in this presentation, but I think it's just so much fun to watch. So here is a visual image in royal pink of, of exactly what we're talking about. So at time zero, here's this dye that's been dumped into this river, and we're going to watch. Um, I don't know about you, but the first time I looked at this, somehow my brain told me that flow was up, but it's actually that way. So if we were to advance in time, what you would see is that that dye is moving down with the flow in the river. See it? Um, now, I made, I made a tiny little cheat here, and that's because already what we're looking at in this river is pretty complicated in terms of transport. So what you're seeing on the right is the real world, and on the left is a really simple version in which we're imagining that instead of just releasing that dye at one moment, we're continually releasing that dye all the time. And so if we were to watch that dye move down the river, it would basically move as a plug of you know, everything that's got dye in it so far, down gradient from that source. And if we keep going forward in time, you're gonna have to give me a little bit of um, artistic license here because the drone was flying all around and it swung around and started looking in different directions. But this is further down river. You can see that there's actually this sort of bow Shape is the original release of that dye, but a whole bunch of it actually got focused in this little channel where the velocity is fast and the water is going around that island. Really, really cool study to get to watch. From our purposes, what we're looking at here is a situation in which eventually, that is T even later, this dye would get much further down the system. Again, on the left, we're thinking about a situation where we're always dumping more dye, more, more, more dye into the river all the time, and so it's just moving. And so eventually, you would kind of get sick of tracking things in terms of time, right? Like nothing's changing anymore. And effectively, that derivative with respect to time would go to zero, and C would equal C everywhere, and we're done. Dye in the entire river. Okay, that was transport. Now we gotta think about reactions. So we'll grab another simple example. Um, this one I got from somewhere. There's apparently an entire world of people that think about what happens when you add bleach to different dyes and how quickly it goes away. Uh, for our purposes, they made a bunch of videos that are fun to watch, and they follow very simple chemistry, basically first-order kinetics. So again, we're starting at zero, and here you can see a solution that's yellow, and it's going to follow this really simple expression. The change in concentration with time now is going to go like the concentration. So as the concentration decreases, the change in concentration is going to decrease through time, so it's slowing down. And it's first order because you don't see any sort of exponents on that concentration. It's just linear concentration and rate constant. And here we go for further in time. So a little bit later, you can see that that solution is getting paler. That yellow is going away and it's following that rate law. And still even further in time, it would basically be gone. And once again, we would be sick of tracking things in time because nothing's really changing anymore. And now the final answer at so-called steady state, or when things don't change anymore in time, is that C equals zero. 
Okay. So here comes the secret sauce. We're going to have to put these two pieces of information together if we're going to have a reactive transport model. So this is my question to you. What do you think this would look like if we have both advection and reaction? I'll give you a minute to think about it. You can pop answers into the chat if you want to. You can say, what on earth is this lady talking about if you want to. It's not super easy the first time you look at it. Because remember, OK, so maybe your first instinct is, well, what happens when we're sick of measuring time? What happens when this left side of the equation is 0? And one of these components would say, well, C is going to be C everywhere. It's advection. It's just going to get carried downriver everywhere. And the other one, the reaction, is going to say C is going to be zero everywhere. So either it's every, everywhere the same or everywhere zero. There's obviously a lot of different answers to this depending on the values that you put into the model. I'll show you one that's typical. And it would look like this at steady state. So what's happening is we're constantly supplying this concentration right here. It's getting invected down the flow path, but it's also decaying because of chemistry. So it's really simple, but it's really important. You can imagine that if this was a contaminant in your drinking water, it would matter a lot if your well was located here versus if your well was located down here. You can also see that there's different ways that this thing is going to behave depending on how these different parameters change. And so, for example, if that reaction is really influential, really fast relative to flow, you'll lose that concentration in a shorter distance. If the flow is really fast compared to the concentration, everything gets pushed much further away down the flow path. Those of you who are sort of dimensionally inclined, you can probably smell some dimensionless numbers lurking in here. And that's exactly how we usually do this, is that we start thinking about time scales of reaction versus time scales of transport. For today, the point is that you guys are now the newest members of the club. You are reactive transport modelers. There's nothing else to it. Don't let anyone tell you that it's super hard and complicated. All it is is just different variations on this. All we're doing is adding different kinds of transport or different kinds of reactivity. So what are those? We can think about different kinds of transport. We just named one, which was advection. That is when stuff goes along with flow, so the dye getting released in that river. We can think about different kinds of reactions. We just named one, which was really simple decay. There's all kinds out there, and you can imagine that there are many that are particularly relevant to the critical zone. You have a bit of fun trying to make your own list. I put a few up here. I probably didn't get all of them. I hope I got your favorite. But now, basically, what I want you to take as we move forward in the, into the next part of our conversation together is that I want you to not be concerned at all about this whole beast of reactive transport. It's really a very simple representation of what's happening in these systems. Yes, we typically use computers, and that's just because it would be really annoying to do this by hand. So we're adding a bunch of different things into this basic framework of an equation, but this is all we're really doing at the end of the day. So what I'd like to do now is actually look at how this works in the context of critical zone systems. Are we good? Or we could go watch the video of the die in the river again. We'll do that if there's time. Okay, so we're back. And you can probably start to think about this now with a little bit more of an eyeball from a reactive transport modeling perspective. Before, we were thinking about flow going, am I pointing the right way for your videos? I can't even think that way. 
we were thinking of flow going from left to right across the screen, right? Now we're thinking about flow going down through the critical zones. So it rains, that water is going to infiltrate into the soil and work its way through all of those little flow paths in the rock. And as it's doing that, that water is going to be reacting with the rock. And it's exactly the same thing. It's a reactive transport problem. If the water is going really fast, then there's not a lot of time for reactions. If the water is going really slowly, then maybe the reactions kind of come to completion and transport isn't that important anymore. And this basic balance between how fast things are reacting and how fast they're moving is fundamentally what dictates the length scales, the profiles that you're looking at in these pictures. And so we want to build models to understand that and to use the models to ask questions like, well, what happens if the climate changes? Or what happens if we knock down all the trees? So that's the whole purpose of these kind of models. So here's one of my favorite new cartoons of exactly the kind of model that we would want to build. So you can see that up here at the land surface, we've got some roots coming in because we want Holly to like us. And we've got some gas getting generated in the soil and we've got water coming in. And the whole idea here is that that water is going to pick up CO2. In fact, I would love for you to show me a soil that doesn't have more PCO2 in it than the air above it. Soils love to create CO2. That's all that organic carbon getting reoxidized in that active organic layer. So the water picks up all that CO2 and basically that makes it really reactive, somewhat acidic. And it makes its way down further into the critical zone where it's able to contact minerals that it can weather and turn into something more like soil. So now it would have been scary if we had seen this equation for the first time just like this, but it's not at all scary, you've seen it. There's nothing to worry about. This is the change in time of the concentration. This is the advection. We're pros at that. This is just another kind of transport. Uh, think of if you had a completely clean cup of water and you drop dye in it, you would see the dye sort of disperse out into the water even though there's no flow. And that's all that this is. It's just mixing. And then there's the wild world of reactivity. And you could cram all kinds of things into here. Any chemical reaction you can think of, we can try to get into here. So that's the same framework that we've been dealing with the whole time in your pros. Okay, in this context, what we want to try to explain is how these kinds of weathering profiles develop in the critical zone, all right? So, what you're looking at here is actually drill cuttings that came out of a well that we drilled down into the critical zone. And when you go from the top up here, you have to go to the right. Then you have to drop back down to the next row and you have to go to the right. And then you have to drop back down to the next row and go to the right. And you can see as you do that, that the gradation in both color and texture of the material is changing. So you are looking at the profile over which this shale got converted to soil. And that's exactly what we want to try to explain. Okay, so hopefully I already sold you on the idea that at least classically, the way that we think that this works is that you pick up reactivity, carbonic acid, CO2 in the soil, the water carries that down to the fresh bedrock and we create these weathering reactions. These are the kind of reactions that we could cram into those rate laws in that reactive transport model. And this should tell us how quickly that rock is being converted to secondary minerals and ultimately to soil. Here's a reactive transport model. You always have to start at the beginning, which is, in other words, you need what we call an initial condition. So we're starting off with a plug of granite. So we see that we've got a bunch of feldspar in there. We have no clays in there yet. So for example, here's gibbsite. And we're going to launch that model forward in time. So now that DC, DT term is changing through time. And we're going to check what happened. And after a while, what you see is that up near the shallow layers, we're losing that primary feldspar. 
and we're gaining clays in all sorts of cool nonlinear ways, right? All kinds of interesting wiggles going on in there. Eventually, it would become boring to continue measuring things in time. We would have reached steady state, at which case we reach a profile in which we're replacing most of the minerals in our bedrock with secondary minerals near the surface, but this bedrock is continuing to be supplied from deep underground in, due to uplift, and so we always have more fresh bedrock, bedrock, <laughs> bedrock to weather at depth. All right, I want to find out if this is true. So we are going to go back to California. We have a bit of a California theme going on today. We're going back to the Eel River where you heard about that wonderful work that Daniela Rempe was doing, understanding the roots in the Eel River critical zone and how they stored water. A really fabulous piece of work that she's championed all the way back from when she was in grad school at Berkeley. So you can really make a big impact at any point starting now in your career. All right. So here, this is actually, let's see, yeah, this is actually the uh, profile that we got from drilling a well in the eel. So we've already looked at this once, and this isn't a normal well. This is kind of special. This is another one of Daniela's amazing tricks. She came up with the idea to install a very special kind of well. Rather than drilling straight down into the ground, we drilled horizontally into the hill. So I need you to kind of put on your imagination caps for a second. If you stand on a hill and you, you orient so that you're looking uphill, I cannot begin to tell you how steep this hill is. It's so steep, it feels like you're going to fall backwards into the stream. But if you started drilling into that hill slope, then you can imagine that the further you drilled, the further the end of that borehole would be from the surface. And so it gives us an ability to collect water at different lengths along the subsurface from, from infiltration of the soil to the collection point. In other words, this is drawn like the earth is flat, but in fact, the earth is tilted and the boreholes are flat. So, it was really cool. It was fun to install. There's Daniela doing the work. There's me supervising. Um, it, we've never had data like this before. It actually gives us a true lens into that weathering profile that we've just been talking about below soil and above the water table. And so as a place, as a point of comparison, maybe we could start off by looking at what happens if instead of collecting the water from this system itself, we took the drill cuttings that you're looking at here back to the lab and we put them into beakers. So this is just like that yellow dye experiment that we were looking at at the beginning of the talk. Except that here now we're watching the dissolution of these minerals through time as a function of the depth that they were collected at. So here's how quickly we can dissolve some of the silica, potassium, magnesium, and sodium from the bedrock. Here's how quickly we can dissolve some of them from cuttings that were located shallower in that weathering profile. So you can see that as you get only a few meters down from the soil, things are very different than if you're many, many tens of meters down from the, from the soil. So clearly there's differences in the geochemistry of this rock as it's converted from the underlying shale to the overlying soil. Now, got it like mentally drum roll. We're gonna look at this in comparison to what we get out of that really specialized well itself. So this is it. I need my model to agree with the data so that I can say that I know the controls on this system and it does not agree. <laughs> Isn't that wild? What you're looking at here is in the black line, the mean, and in the gray, the standard deviation of the concentrations that we measure for these depths out of this special well relative to the concentrations that we can create in the lab. Orders of magnitude different and persistently, consistently higher concentrations in the water draining through this natural environment than anything we can create in the lab. And think about that. That's despite the fact 
that we've crushed the samples, that we've opened them up, right? So there's, there's a lot to consider here in terms of what's going on in this system. So we need to go back to the drawing board. One of the best things about models is that they are humbling. There's many times where you've just literally done something wrong in terms of setting them up and you find your error and you, and you fix your calculation and all as well. And then there's other times where they literally show you that you don't know what's going on yet in a system. And it can be terrifying, but it can also be the moment of truth. It can be the advancement that you've been looking for. And that's exactly what's happened for us here. So I'm taking us all the way back to this conceptual model that in the very shallow soil, we pick up carbon, particularly CO2, that's gonna make the water acidic and that's gonna drive these weathering reactions much further in the depth profile. Now, we had the best introduction to this field site I could have ever hoped for this morning. Because as you now know, the roots in this system tap way down, many meters down into the subsurface. And thanks to that really specialized well that Daniela installed, we were also able to look at the gas profiles in the subsurface. And what you are seeing here is something that none of us expected. What we're seeing is a persistent pattern of increasing PCO2, increasing CO2 in the rock below soil, many meters down. Now, in fact, this profile requires the production of CO2 right about here. And that's the same location where those trees are tapping all that water. And so we're beginning to realize that those deep roots and that forest are doing more than just changing the water dynamics in the system. They're also changing the chemistry. And in particular, they're creating a deep carbon source that's charging all of that water with reactive potential. So I think you can see, let me, let me see if I can put it here. I think you can see that we're getting a lot of new understanding out of this reactive transport framework in terms of how water converts rock to soil and how carbon is driving that reactivity in these subsurface systems. You might also notice that we have oxygen in these profiles as well. And the oxygen is varying a lot, right? Isn't that neat? So one thing to point out right away is that the oxygen content in these profiles is really pretty high when it's dry. In other words, the dry periods of years. So think of it this way, there's not a lot of water in the system. Those trees have used up all the water that's available. And now the pore space is becoming really open and everything's sort of going, <gasps> and it's like it's breathing. And then in the wet part of the year, when there's a lot more water inside of the pores, there's much less space for the gases and the oxygen becomes really limited. So this is the full circle. We're getting there, all right? Here you're looking at a cumulative precipitation record for a few years at the Eel River and the oxygen distribution as a function of depth thanks to that beta sun monitoring system. And you can see that as soon as it starts to rain, we begin to wet up the shallow subsurface and the deeper oxygen content suddenly becomes really limited. It's like one little bit of rain on the top of the system and all the oxygen underneath gets consumed. And we can look at that in a little bit more detail thanks to the VMS. You can see the variations in water content about six meters down. These are the periods of year where the trees are sucking that water up to get through the drought. These are the periods of time in which it's raining and that water is being replenished. And you can see this mirror image in oxygen in the subsurface. So you can really think of this thing as a lung, like it's breathing. What's really interesting to us is that many more meters down, when we go deep down into the subsurface, the water content is stable, and yet you see the same oscillation in oxygen. So what's going on up here where the trees are rooting is impacting the oxygenation, the, the redox state of the system much deeper into the critical zone. 
I'll take this one step further. So here again, we're looking at three years of cumulative precipitation, and now we're looking at the water content in each one of the ports of that special well. So you can see when it's shallower, you get dips and troughs and peaks and troughs and peaks, and when it's deeper, things are pretty stable. We can actually overlay on this when we are physically able to collect water from the VMS. And this is exactly what we heard about this morning. This water is missing. We can't suck it out of that location in the well, not because it's drained down, but because it's gone up through the roots of the trees. So this totally changes our perspective of reactive transport. We started out at the beginning of this conversation thinking about things like advection, like die in a river, which is very one directional. And honestly, a lot of us think in terms of reactive transport as a one directional process through the shallow subsurface as well. It's just rain infiltrating down. And now here we're seeing that not only does the content of water and its reactivity change through different times of the year, but literally the direction that it leaves the critical zone is reversing as a result of these trees. So I love this because I think that this is such a nice demonstration of what critical zone science teaches us when we take this holistic framework of how the deep trees or the deeply rooted trees in this system are first impacting moisture, which you saw this morning, but having an attendant influence on the gases, which strongly dictates how reactive these systems are and ultimately creates a really unexpected result in terms of the solute chemistry. So I, I don't know what time it is, but I think I'm about right, <laughs> I, I hope. Gosh, I think you have more time, am I wrong? I think. I think we have about 12 minutes, so um, that can include Q&A. So if people do have questions, please put them in the chat box. But uh, Jenny, you're welcome to take a few more minutes if you'd like them to. I'm happy to do either. I have more that I can talk about. I have more slides, but um, I think we had also talked about leaving some time for discussion. So whatever, whatever you guys would like. Uh, um, why don't we give people a few minutes to put things in chat and you can take a couple of minutes for sure. Okay. Um, all right, so um, I hope that, so I'll just wrap up while you guys, sorry. there's construction going on in front of my house and my dog is defending us from dump trucks, so I apologize for the noise. But I'll just take a couple more minutes while you guys are putting some questions into the chat window to show you a few other directions that we're headed with this kind of reactive transport modeling in application to critical zone science. Um, I love this one because who doesn't like looking at a movie? Uh, <laughs> but what we're looking at here is trying to take the, the sort of models that we use to, to explain how and why and where solutes are generated. In other words, the concentration in the water is created as water interacts with rock in the subsurface. And I'm trying to turn that into a more two-dimensional structure. In other words, everything that we've been talking about today has been water going down or water going up. But as soon as water gets to the groundwater table, then it's gonna to start to move laterally and it's gonna to start to deliver to the stream. And so I think it's a real um, goal in the critical zone community right now to be able to link the chemical evolution of water from soil to stream. And I think we're about there and able to do that. Now I can see Lily on the chat, so I'm nervous because she knows more than me. Um, we're also doing a bunch of really cool stuff with isotopes, and isotopes are amazing. I spend so much time trying to get isotopes to function properly in these models because they basically come along for the ride of whatever element you're tracking in terms of concentration, but only some things make their ratios change while others don't. So they're super sensitive indicators of particular aspects of all the different processes that are going on in the system. So I'm showing one plot of flow rate versus carbon isotopes that we're using to understand karst and what speleothems in caves actually record through time, which is so much fun, also because we get to go in caves. Um, and finally, we're trying to understand physical heterogeneity. Now that, that tends to be one of these words that people just use to explain anything that's hard to explain. 
Um, but what we really mean is that there's um, structure in the subsurface, for example, fractures versus blocks of rock. And so you can imagine that flow isn't a perfectly linear path. It takes a circuitous route through the system. And so I think, we think that in many ways, these isotope ratios are actually more sensitive to that heterogeneity than what we see in the concentration measurements. And that's why we're turning more and more to the isotopes in terms of understanding how streams record the geochemical signatures of watersheds, for example. So I think that there's a huge future out there for this. So if you're excited about that, please get in touch with me. Um, and I'll put that there and I'd be delighted to take questions if anyone has.